Which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. And righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Well, there is no doubt about it. Sixty years on the throne is a long time. Sixty years on the throne is, um, it's not a record, <clears throat> but it's pretty close to it. Queen Victoria, of course, was on the throne for 64 years. And she also celebrated a diamond jubilee in 1897. And you can still see uh, various tributes uh, to um, uh, Queen Victoria's reign and her diamond jubilee around the country, there are still things that are there um, that, uh, that were, were, were erected in 1897 to mark those 60 years. I haven't researched it, but I'm assuming the jubilee line was uh, set up for one of the um, uh, anniversaries. I don't know if it was the 50th or 60th. Does anyone know? But I'm assuming it was something to do with that. But uh, nobody seems to know. All right, okay. But I remember also going on holiday, there's a clock in, in the centre of Weymouth, which of course was there to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee of the Queen. And we often used to holiday in Weymouth. And, uh, <clears throat> and I can still see um, uh, my granddad sitting under the clock. The main reason I can see him there is because he managed to get into a postcard sitting under the clock. And uh, somewhere around is the postcard with granddad sitting under the clock uh, in Weymouth, um, somewhere there. So, um, uh, but people like to mark these significant events. They are important for us. And I know that there is, you know, some uh, sour grapes going on. And uh, I was reading in the Times uh, just earlier this week um, a, an article by someone who's quite clearly a Republican and doesn't really see what we're celebrating for and, uh, and says, you know, this is an empty jubilee that there is nothing left of uh, the kingdom to celebrate. Well, you can look at it like that if you want to. Or you can be more positive and you can see some of the good sides and the positive things uh, that a monarchy brings to a country like ours. But I think whatever you do or however you look at it, whether it's a queen, whether it's a president or whoever it is, that we always need to have powers and authorities that are over us, that we look up to. I think the converse approach to looking at it in a Republican kind of manner is another article that I read in the paper this week that was very much pro the Queen and celebrating it and spoke about the stability that the 60-year reign has given this country that we may not have had in other forms of government. And I know that the Queen's powers are uh, quite limited in one respect, and yet at the same time, that continuity gives us something that we, we like. It's stability that's in the country. 
And uh, we're very grateful that the Lord has given us uh, that length of time. And I know that's not always the case when uh, a monarch comes to power. Some reigns are very short indeed. But we've been blessed to have this long reign. But it made me think a little bit more about the reign of Christ. Because, you see, we serve ultimately the King of Kings. And regardless on what your opinions are on the monarchy in the UK today, <clears throat> if we are Christians, we worship a king. We serve the king. And the writer to the Hebrews really lifts that king high here in chapter 1. In fact, I think sometimes it's good to get an overview of a book, so I'm going to try and do that very briefly too. The book of Hebrews I always used to find daunting. Uh, there was so much of the, the Jewish imagery that was in Hebrews, so much about people whose names I could hardly pronounce, like Melchizedek. <laughs> It took me all week to pronounce that. Hope you're impressed. Um, Melchizedek, you know, I mean, he was, uh, you know, this, this, this priest and king who just came from nowhere and disappeared uh, into thin air, it seems, almost. Um, but then you see there are others um, that, that, that appear in the book of Hebrews and, and say all oh, this Jewish imagery, and, and I used to find it confusing. And I remember, you know, 30 years plus now, um, ago in our, our church at home that there was a series that was taking place and it was alternating week by week. One week was the pastor and the other week was a very gifted Bible teacher that we had in the church at the time and uh, he was um, uh, speaking from the book of Hebrews and the pastor was doing something else but I just seem to remember that this series on Hebrews which lasted about 25 years or it seemed like that at the time, but thinking about it, the pastor was only there for five years, so it couldn't have been that long. But, but it just seemed like it was going on forever and ever and ever. And I go into church on a Sunday morning. Okay, you bear in mind I was like a 10-year-old or something at the time. But, you know, it just didn't make any sense to me whatsoever as I was trying to get my head around, um, uh, you know, all the things that he was talking about. And, uh, you know, and, and it was very, very confusing. And, and I think for that reason... Uh, rather than uh, inspiring me, it kind of made me a little bit frightened of the book of Hebrews to think to yourself, you know, do I really understand? And he was great at connecting with the children of Israel in the book of Exodus. And he was linking back to Exodus all the time. And, uh, but it was incredible. But, you know, when you look at it, when you read through the book of Hebrews, and, uh, okay, maybe with a little bit of understanding as well, but... It's not as daunting as it sounds. And if I really wanted to um, uh, give a, a very simple overview of the book of Hebrews this morning, <clears throat> I'd probably say something like this. What the writer to Hebrews is doing is showing us just how great Jesus is. See, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets, he says in verse 1. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. And he says that God himself came down to earth because he wanted to send someone even greater than the prophets. <clears throat> now the Jews had great respect for the prophets of old. They revered them very much. But he says, greater than the prophets is Jesus. The Jews had apparently this great respect for the mysterious heavenly creatures called angels. I know one of our PCG groups has been studying angels recently, so I might hand over to them at this point, um, and they can tell us about the angels. But the point is that, that the Jews really had this, this, this great reverence, apparently, for them. And uh, when you understand that, suddenly chapter 1 makes sense, and chapter 2 for that matter. Because the writer of Hebrews seems to be going on and on about angels. And he's speaking about angels the whole time here. Um, and he's making these comparisons. And what he's really saying is this. That the Son of God 
is greater than the angels. It says he's much greater than the angels. The angels were sent as messengers. Later on, he'll tell you that the, the, the angels, he says, are the ones who came and brought the text of the law to Moses. Pretty hard pressed to find that in Exodus, but that's what Hebrews claims. But he says, but now God's son has come. And by saying God's son, he's saying the deity, this is God in the flesh, God incarnate, has come. But then as you carry on through Hebrews, he then comes to the human side of Jesus. He speaks about the man. And he says, not only is he God, but he's also man. And he says, you Jews, you revere certain people in your history as being the greatest people ever. Moses. Moses who gave you the law. Moses who gave you the law that put chains upon you. That put burdens upon your backs. That never saved you, but gave you a hard time. He says, you think that Moses was great. Chapter 3 is dedicated to the fact that Jesus is greater than Moses. In fact, Moses, he says, tried to give you the law. It gave you boundaries and you kept within those boundaries. And when you did, God blessed you and that's great. And we still use those today with the the Ten Commandments. But he says, um, there's also... Um, this whole thing about rest. Moses was leading you towards the promised land, a land of rest. But firstly, none of the people that Moses led out of Egypt ever found the promised land. And secondly, Moses himself never saw the promised land. They never entered his rest. But Jesus brings you into the promised land, into the rest that uh, should be yours. He goes on to speak about sin, the effects of sin, and the fact that, of course, there was the high priest. And the high priest was a great person, and people revered the high priest because the high priest went in once a year on the Day of Atonement, and he took the sacrifices that were necessary and the blood of the sacrifices into the center, into the very holy of holies of the temple, and there he offered atonement for the people. And he sprinkled that blood all around and and over the altars, and and he went in there, and, and he did what he could for the people. But not one single drop of that blood removed the slightest bit of sin. All the animals that were sacrificed didn't achieve anything. <clears throat> the 250,000 lambs, quarter of a million lambs, estimated to have been slaughtered at Passover each year in the time of Jesus, didn't remove a single sin. But Jesus is our great high priest and he goes in and it is Jesus who takes away our sin. Jesus is greater than the high priest. The high priest was of uh, Moses' family and particularly from Aaron, his brother. And so that particular family was lifted up as being a great family the Levitical family, the Levites, because of the responsibility that was placed on their shoulder. But Jesus, it says, was a priest like Melchizedek, king of Salem, that's Jerusalem. And he says, so great was Melchizedek that even Abraham, we're going back to Abraham now, the father of the nation, even Abraham paid a tithe to Melchizedek. He gave him a tenth of everything that he had. He had that much honor and respect for this king of Salem and the priest. And he says, in a sense, Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek, who we don't know where he came from, we don't know where he went to. We know nothing about his family, we know nothing about him. And he says, he's just like, except that Jesus is greater than Melchizedek. Jesus is greater than Abraham. 
Jesus is greater than them all because Jesus has himself gone into as the priest, as the one who understands our weaknesses because Jesus is God and he's man and he has come down to this earth. He has lived as a man but he lived perfectly and so therefore he's able to be our high priest. The high priest has to be able to sympathize with the weaknesses of the people, the, the writer of the Hebrews says. And so Jesus is qualified to be our high priest. And he says, and he goes into a tabernacle, but he says it's not into the tent, into the, the temple that was built with the hands of men, because that was only a copy and a shadow of a real place, a real tabernacle, a real temple. And he says, Jesus, when he went to the cross, he went into the real tabernacle, that real tent of sacrifice. The curtain in the temple in Jerusalem when Jesus died was torn in two, which signified, from top to bottom incidentally, which signified God was opening up that way for Jesus to go in and to enter in. And he says, Jesus has gone into the temple, the tabernacle that really counts, where the sacrifices really do have an effect. The sacrifice being of Jesus himself. He was greater than any other sacrifice, chapter 10 tells us. You think the sacrifices are great. You think it's wonderful to offer these sacrifices. He says, better than any sacrifice is the sacrifice of Jesus. His blood is the greatest. Chapter 11 brings us on to the great chapter of faith. And many of us will know that. Now it is, you know, faith is, is uh, being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. And this is what the ancients were commended for. And then by faith, and he goes through listing some of these people that we, we know their names of. He speaks about Abel and Enoch and Noah, and then on to Abraham. And uh, then he goes on uh, to speak about Jacob and Joseph and Moses. And so he goes on. And finally, as he comes to the end, he says, uh, what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jepheth, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And he says, all these people lived by faith. He says, these were great people. These were people who were uh, you know, considered by the nation of Israel to be some of the greatest people that ever lived. And we misunderstand, in my opinion, chapter 11, because usually when we preach on chapter 11, we speak about chapter 11, we're doing it to say, look how wonderful these people are, we should be like them. But the writer to Hebrews is saying, look at all these people who live by faith, they never received what was promised, he says at the end. They lived by faith, they never actually got it. They were faithful people, waiting and waiting. But he says, in Christ... You get everything. Jesus is greater than all of these people who lived by faith. Greater than all of them. And therefore, <clears throat> as he starts to bring his, his letter, I love the way at the end of Hebrews, he says, I've only written to you a short letter after 13 chapters. I hate to see a long one. <clears throat> but as he comes to the end. He says this to the people. He tells them that um, they are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So in a nutshell, the whole of Hebrews is dedicated to saying, no matter how great the people of this world are, no matter how great the people of faith are, Jesus is greater. He has achieved more. He has done more than anybody else. And he starts off in chapter 1 by speaking about these mysterious creatures, the angels. I don't know what you think about angels I know people who think that they have seen angels. I know people who think that um, they may have been in the presence of angels. But no one can be sure. We certainly have quite a lot of testimony through scripture 
of the work of angels, ministering to people. Billy Graham wrote a book many years ago called just that, Angels. Very interesting, some of the stories that are contained within that book of people who had angels protecting them, who physically appeared at different times when there were needs. I've often wondered what the purpose of angels really are as far as we're concerned. I mean, God is all-powerful, God speaks, and the universe is created. Why does he need a messenger? Why does he need someone to come and act as a protector? I don't know the answers to all these questions. But what I do know is that angels are real. They're there primarily to glorify and praise God, to lift him up. But they're there too as these messengers. As he says here, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? It's an interesting verse, isn't it? How do they serve us, I wonder? Are we even aware? <clears throat> do you know, the fact is that if you're too aware of angels, I suggest that you may actually have got it wrong. Let me explain why. Because the whole point of the angels is that they remain inconspicuous. If they appeared, I mean, some people say to me, or uh, have said to me, you know, why is it that angels don't just, you know, if you've got a guardian angel, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, Psalm 34 tells us. If we've really got angels, why don't they make themselves visible? I'll tell you why, because you'd start to worship them. When angels appeared to people in Scripture, very often people fell down before them. <clears throat> there are one or two instances where the angels had to stop the human beings from worshipping. Look in the book of Revelation, as John had his vision. The angels had to stop him. He said, don't worship us. <clears throat> you worship him. All the glory goes back to him. And the reason the glory goes back to him is because, as verse 8 reminds us, quoting the Psalms, your throne, O God, will last forever. Righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. And therefore, he says, this is the king. Last week uh, it was Pentecost, and uh, for those of you that are here, we were looking last week at the relationship between the ascension of Jesus ten days earlier and Pentecost, and we said that unless, well, we said Jesus himself said in John 16, unless I go, the Spirit cannot come. And we said the reason for that is that the Spirit has this wider ministry. Jesus had quite a narrow ministry. The Spirit has a wider ministry throughout the world. And the only time that could happen is when Jesus had completed his bit of the narrower ministry, culminating in the cross. The price of sin is paid for at Calvary. And as he died, our sin is taken away. And as he rose back to life again, so he guarantees new life for us as believers as well. If Jesus is raised from the dead, we too can have new life. And he says, now my task is complete. And he goes back to the Father to take his throne and as he sits upon the throne there, there it signifies Jesus is king. Now even the writer to the Hebrews further on in the book acknowledges that Jesus is king of everything. And yet he says, however, not everything appears to be subject to him. And we made just that point last week. I wish I'd read that verse before last week. I would have quoted it then. But he says, that we look around and we say, but not everything is subject to Jesus. And that's true, of course, that there are many things that appear not to be in his control at the moment. But we said that the kingdom of God is growing. We are receiving a kingdom. We just quoted. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And that kingdom is brought through the Holy Spirit. And it enters into people person by person as little victories are won. Satan is defeated. He is in chains. He is now in the triumphal procession. He roars around. He does what he can to frighten people. 
But when you put your faith and your trust in Christ, you realize that he has absolutely no hold over you. You are free, and if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. And so in that freedom that we get in Christ, the kingdom of God grows. We submit to him. We bow the knee to him voluntarily. One day, the scripture tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But at the moment, we do it voluntarily. We come to him and we say, Jesus is my Lord. I submit everything to him. And that's really important that we can do that. And that as we take the good news of Jesus, the gospel message from one person to another, the Holy Spirit opens up hearts and minds that they may understand and receive as well. And in that way, inch by inch, the kingdom of God grows. We have a vital part to play in taking the kingdom out. But the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. And we said the greatest sin that he convicts people of is unbelief. That's what Jesus tells us in John 10. Unbelief. If you can get that one sorted out, all the others start to fall into place. And so it's important for us to understand that here in Hebrews chapter 1, that as the writer of the Hebrews lifts Jesus up and he says he's greater than anything and anyone and all created things, he is the creator. Everything else is created. Therefore, we bow the knee to him. We give allegiance to him. We recognize that he is above all things and deserves all honor glory and respect and today as we celebrate the jubilee of a human monarch we give thanks for those 60 years but we're reminded that Jesus reign continues forever and ever and ever I quoted earlier that uh, in the the coronation uh, service of the queen that there are those words to the effect that say that as, as the crown is passed over, it's not forever. <clears throat> that the queen is reminded, or the monarch as they receive that, is reminded that the crown is given to them until he comes to whom it belongs. There is that acknowledgement. Let me just read to you from Revelation chapter 20. And um, here we have this uh, beautiful... Sorry, chapter 19. Beautiful picture of the end of time. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying midair, Come gather together for the great supper of God. We're going to stop just there for a moment. But there you see this picture of the end of time, of Jesus coming back <clears throat> for the final uh, claiming of the kingdom which he paid so dearly for, the robe dipped in blood, the name that only he knows, and then suddenly that name 
is revealed, King of kings and Lord of lords. As we were reading in the book of Hebrews, i just flick back to Hebrews again. As we were reading back in uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 1, it says in verse 4, So he, Jesus, became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. What is that name that he has inherited? Surely it is this name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's saying there is no one greater than him. No matter what titles the angels have, no matter whether they are archangels, no matter whether they're given the name Michael or Gabriel, or whether they're called seraphs, or whatever they might be, he says, there is none like him. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. When he comes back, he has many crowns upon his head, Revelation tells us, because he has the crowns of the nations. They're all upon his head, because Jesus is king. And that's what we celebrate week by week, day by day in our lives. But today is a very special time when we can be reminded of that whilst we celebrate with our own queen in this country, we remember that Jesus is the king.